Well, happy Sunday afternoon. Um, we are getting very close to the end of Exodus, um, two out of the 66 books of the Bible, uh, two fairly long ones, actually, so that's pretty exciting. Um, by the time we get to the New Testament, if uh, I get to get the opportunity to do all of these, do all of them, then uh, we'll be hitting some fairly short uh, passages, or, or, or short books, but uh, New Testament's probably got some thickness to it as well in terms of, of what the content is, whereas like today, 37 and 38 are uh, essentially repetition, and um, they're going to be mostly reading, and I'm going to be doing some comparing, some going back and forth between uh, where it was originally instructed and where it was uh, actually carried out and show that they are exactly the same, because uh, that's a very important thing. So uh, anyway, today uh, we are in Exodus 37 and 38, I'm going to do both chapters. Uh, I'm not going to have too much in the way of commentary, so I uh, appreciate you uh, joining me while uh, we're getting everybody a chance to sign on. I'm going to pull up what it is on my phone here. There it is. That way I get the functionality of that as well. Make sure the volume is done. So um, I know it's Sunday afternoon, I know it's the weekend. Uh, a lot of people have their own uh, worship services. Uh, either to prepare for or that they're involved with. I know my dad's probably not going to be on today because he's his own congregation has a, a worship thing that they're doing, and uh, so he's going to participate in that. He said catch it later, either here on Facebook or on YouTube when I get posted up, and that's fine. Um, <clears throat> but those of you who can make it, uh, I appreciate you being here. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Exodus chapter thirty-seven and verse one and Bezaliel made the ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half was the length of it, and a cubit and a half the breadth of it, and a cubit and a half the height of it. So Bezaliel is the overseer for all of the work that is related to like building and architecture, that kind of thing. Um, he, he does like the, the heavier duty kind of stuff. Um, well, I got a little hair hanging here off my mic. Uh, anyway, uh, and Aholiab does more of the, the fine work, like the, the cloth, the vestments, the, the sewing, and whatever, and that's what he's overseeing. So <coughs> those guys divided it out. And it, it, again, the, the shittim wood or the acacia wood, I wanted to show a picture of that here. You can see um, it's a somewhat red wood, uh, very beautiful. This is, this is, of course, finished and everything. Somebody's making a, a, a table out of a, a big old... Uh, acacia wood slab here but uh, it's a very pretty wood uh, a little bit darker in color um, and you can just imagine what the altar uh, with the table all of those things that were made out of it uh, this is what it kind of looks like so the other thing is is uh, it says that he made it two two cubits and a half uh, he made uh, the that was the length a cubit and a half the breadth and the cubit and a half was the height we come over here to Exodus 25 where it was first commanded uh, and it says, you'll make an arc of, there's the acacia, the shittim wood, two cubits and a half shall be the length, a cubit and a half the breadth, and a cubit and a half the height. So he makes it according to all that was shown after the pattern uh, of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof. So we show you make it. So that's exactly what Bezaliel is doing. That's what Aholiab does. And I'm going to show you this back and forth from time to time here to show you that they do match up all the way down the line. It's exactly following that pattern because that is uh, important to God. And as we've talked about in the past, <coughs> the tabernacle is a type pointing to the church, the New Testament church. Um, and so when God instructs us how to build the temple of the New Testament, which building blocks we are a part of, that is the, the Christians, the individual people who make up the church, we are the temple. And when we want to be a part of that temple, when we want to be a part of that church, we need to follow the pattern that we've been given. And if you try to follow any other pattern, any any group of people, any religious organization, that follows a different pattern. That is, number one, a man-made pattern. And number two, that pattern is not going to save you because you cannot be saved in a temple built by man. You can only be saved in the temple that God built. 
you can only be saved in the body of Christ, which there is only one, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4, and that body is his church, Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23. So there is only one church, only one temple, only one bride, only one body, and we have to be a part of the, the temple that was built after the pattern that was given to us. It's sheer arrogance to, to build any other thing, to, to try to improve upon God's design in any way. So, <clears throat> all right. Um, verse 2, he overlaid it with pure gold within and without and made a crown of gold to it around about. And you can go back to Exodus 25 and read that that's what he was commanded to do. And he cast for it four rings of gold to be set by the four corners of it, even two rings upon the one side of it and two rings upon the other side of it. He made staves of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold, and he put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark to bear the ark. And he made the mercy seat of pure gold, two cubits and a half was the length thereof, and one cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And he made two cherubims of gold beaten out of one piece, made he them on two ends of the mercy seat. So this, this mercy seat is a lid for the ark. It's a, a, a cap that goes on it. So if we scroll down in Ephesians, uh, Ephesians Exodus, uh, chapter 25, verse 17, uh, you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half will be the length, cubit and a half the breadth, and make two cherubims of gold, a beaten work, you shall make them. That's exactly, we're, we're repeating over and over again everything that Moses was instructed. Now we're seeing it actually being carried out and actually being built. One cherub on the, one in, or, or on the end on this side and another cherub on the other end on the other side. Out of the mercy seat made he the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims spread out their wings on high and covered with their wings over the mercy seat with their faces one to another. So again, we see this, the covering of the mercy seat with their wings, their faces shall look one to another. And he made the table uh, of, of the acacia wood. Two cubits was the length thereof, and a cubit and a breadth, uh, a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And he overlaid it with pure gold, and made thereunto a crown of gold around about. And he also made thereunto a border of a handbreadth round about, and made a crown of gold for the border there of round about. So uh, this table is also in here. Um, you can see uh, there's, a, there's the table of acacia wood. There's the measurements and stuff. So he's following those measurements exactly. <clears throat> and he cast for it four rings of gold and put the rings upon the four corners that were in the four feet thereof. Over against the border were the rings, the places for the staves to bear the table. And he made the staves of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold to bear the table. And he made the vessels which were upon the table, his dishes, and his spoons, and his bowls, and his covers to cover withal of pure gold. And he made the candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work made he the candlestick. His shaft and his branch, his bowls, his knops, and his flowers were of the same. The six branches going out of the sides thereof, three branches of the candlestick out of one side thereof, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side, exactly as it was laid out uh, in earlier chapters. You have the, the single main candle in the middle, and then you have three branches coming out of the main branch or, or, or the main trunk of it <clears throat> to form seven total. Uh, again, the lampstands are important. The lampstands represent um, the congregation of the people and them being in good favor with God. And, uh, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about God's presence here in the tabernacle. We talk a lot about, uh, hey, John, welcome aboard. Uh, we see a lot about, uh, you know, build this tabernacle and I will come and dwell with my people. Uh, build this temple and I will come and dwell with my people. But we also note that the, the, the menorah here, this candle, represents them being in the presence of God. And that's super important. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, things are going. Um, getting ready to, to gear back up for the school year. Uh, lots of craziness going on, as you know. Uh, but... Uh, we're, uh, we're, we're okay here. We're, we're doing fine. Kids are growing like weeds and stuff. So uh, thank you for asking. I hope everything's well with you. So I hope it's not uh, too crazy with all of this COVID stuff. So, <clears throat> uh, so anyway, the, the lampstand represents the, the people before God. And we see in Revelation 2 and 3, uh, and even in chapter 1, that there were these seven lampstands that represented the congregations of the people, the various individual congregations of the church. And 
Uh, they were there before God, and his warning was, don't let your lampstand be removed. And that, that's uh, an interesting uh, figure that we have there, this, this symbolic idea of, of the presence of, represented by these lampstands. Well, here is the, the reality. is this lampstand that they were supposed to build in the tabernacle representing the people's presence with God. So, thanks, man. You too. I really, I really uh, hope you have a great year. So, with that and your music too. Um, <clears throat> all right. So, uh, verse nineteen: three bowls made after the fashion of almonds in one branch, a knot and a flower, and three bowls made like almonds in another branch, a knot and a flower. So these are the, at the very top where the, the candles would actually be stuck. Uh, to be lit. That's that's what these little almond-shaped bowls are in the knops, and, and it looks like a flower and everything. So throughout the six branches going out of the candlestick, and into the candlestick were four bowls made like almonds, his knops and his flowers, and a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same. So doop, doop, doop is what it was essentially doing. Um, according to the six branches going out of it, their knops and their branches were uh, of the same. All of it was one beaten work of pure gold. So they basically made this out of one, one piece of gold uh, and shaped it that way. And he made his seven lamps and his snuffers and his snuff dishes of pure gold. Um, so the, the, the seven represents the, the branches and, and whatever. And then they had the snuffers as the thing to put the candle out uh, and catch the ashes. That's the snuff dishes and everything. Of a talent of pure gold made he it, and all the vessels thereof, as he was commanded. And he made the incense altar of acacia wood, and the length of it was a cubit, and the breadth of it a cubit. It was four square, and two cubits was the height. And I don't know, sometimes the, the highlighting doesn't show up. So the incense altar, and we'll uh, go ahead and highlight this. And I think it's already highlighted over here. That's in Exodus 27 down here. And you shall make an altar, and there's the... The altar of Shittim wood and it's four square and all that. So those are, again, you can, hello, I guess not. You can see that they're the same. So, um, and two cubits was the height of it. The horns thereof were the same. And he overlaid it with pure gold, both the top of it and the sides thereof round about. And the horns of it also he made into a crown of gold round about. He made two rings of gold for it under the crown thereof by the two corners of it. Upon the two sides thereof to be places for the staves to bear it withal. Remember, the people were not supposed to touch these things. The commandment here. Now, nowhere in any of this instruction, in Exodus 25 and, and moving forward where Moses is receiving the instruction, and nowhere in Exodus 36 or 35 where it started uh, moving forward where they actually do the building of these things, does God command them, don't touch these things. Don't touch the ark. Don't touch the table. Don't touch the altar. He never actually says that. What he does do is command them how they're supposed to carry it. He says, to carry the ark, you put these staves in it, these long staff. It's a staff. The staves is just plural of staff. You're going to put these long staves through the rings, and you carry it by the rings. And so when God commands, do it this way, what happens when we try to do it another way? Do we have an example of that? Well, of course we do. What happened to uh, Uzzah? The, a, a fairly familiar story. Uh, for those of us who grew up going to Bible class and stuff, the, the man Uzzah, in fact, I can look that up here just real quick. Um, oops. Well, if I can spell. <coughs> so here we are in, in 2 Samuel 6. And it says, And David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David rose and went with all the people that were with him from uh, Baal of Judah to bring up from the, thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of Jehovah of hosts, that dwelleth be, dwells between the cherubims. Okay, that's talking about the ark there. Uh, hey, Charlie, glad to have you on board. We're, we're in Exodus 37 and 38. We're about to finish up uh, uh, the book of Exodus here, so... Uh, right now we're talking about how the ark and the table and all of those things had to be carried by the staves, even though God didn't command anyone not to touch those things. No, no, you can't find where God said, don't touch the ark of covenant, don't touch the table, don't touch the altar. He did give us instruction on how to do so, how to uh, 
uh, carry the ark, how to carry the table, how to carry the altar, and that was those staves through the rings. So now we're looking at an example of what happens when man goes beyond and tries to do it a different way than what God commands. Uh, so anyway, verse 3, And they set the ark of God upon a new cart. Well, that's not how they're supposed to do it. They set it on an ark, God said carry it with the staves, and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah, and Uzzah and Ahio, uh, I guess, the sons of Abinadab drove the cart. So Uzzah and Ahio are, are driving the cart. They've got the little animals, and they're beside the cart, and they're kind of swatting the animals just a little bit to get them to move. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark. And Ahio went before the ark. And so Uzzah's in the back, Ahio's in the front. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord. That is, they played their instruments and sang and all that. On all manner of instruments made of fir wood, on harps, psalteries, on timbrels and cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. Now remember, God never commands anywhere, don't touch the ark. But he does command, you can only carry the ark by those staves. And so by, by commanding something specific, this is called the law of specificity. Some people call it the law of silence. I don't think that goes far enough. I don't think that's framed correctly. I think the law of specificity, when God specifies a thing, and we go beyond what is specified, we are disobeying God. You can, you can see this example in in just everyday life. When you go to like Taco Bell, I've been going to Taco Bell here lately, um, and you order, um, for, for me, I order a um, chicken burrito, and it's gotta have chicken cheese, sour cream, and guacamole. And that's what I order. And when I get up to the, the window, if they say that'll be $253.98, I'm going to ask them why. And they say, well, there's one of everything on the menu. And I would tell them, well, I didn't order those things. And they would say, well, you didn't say not to. Well, that doesn't make any sense. And so in our, our normal everyday lives, the law of specificity is applied and everybody understands it by specifying a, a specific thing in a category. You limit that category to that specific thing and so Uzzah puts forth his, forth his hand in verse 7 and the anger of Jehovah was kindled against Uzzah and God smote him there for his error and there he died by the ark of God and so uh, you know the the type there the, the instruction and the specificity those kinds of things hey Dean welcome aboard um, when, when God specifies a thing he automatically eliminates any other uh, thing in that category. And we see this in the New Testament. Um, I just got finished talking to a friend about you know, the one church and, and what does that look like. And one of the things that identifies the one church is the worship of the one church. Specifically, what do the denominations add? They add the mechanical instruments. There is nowhere in the New Testament where God ever commands that we use mechanical instruments. Okay, in fact, the only time that he really mentions them, he talks about them in 1 Corinthians, and he says that they, they give an uncertain sound, that they, they are, are just noise. And that's the truth. They don't fulfill the purpose of singing, the, the teaching and the admonishing, the edifying of one another. That, that we're supposed to sing with understanding. The singing that we do in the New Testament is for, um, uh, as a mnemonic device, to help us to remember the truths of scripture better and it's a reflexive singing the whole congregation as it says singing to yourselves so it's a reflexive thing it's not an entertainment thing it's not a group of the good singers up there in the front entertaining us and we're just listening we're not passive in the worship we have to be active in this act of worship and so when god specifies sing in colossians three sixteen, and ephesians five nineteen, and in first corinthians uh, 14 that uh, or 1415, that we're supposed to sing, and by specifying singing, he eliminates every other form of musical worship to him. And it's so hard for so many people to understand that, not because the logic is hard, because Taco Bell, but because 
I like this thing. This makes me feel good. And that's what it's about. It becomes about their feelings. It becomes about, you know, what do I get out of it? And the a cappella congregational singing just doesn't do it for a lot of people. Because they always want more and they want beyond. And, they, and, and just like the Israelites, wanting more and beyond what God knew was good for them. And so we cannot go beyond the pattern that God has given us. That's Everything in Exodus has been about that pattern. And that includes the carrying of, of these things by staves. And by specifying that they were to be carried by the staves, going beyond that kindles the anger of God. All right. Um, <clears throat> So, verse 28, And he made the staves of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. And he made the holy anointing oil and the pure incense of sweet spices according to the work of the apothecary. Okay, so he's basically doing, again, we go back up to, to, to 25 in verse uh, 10, I believe it was, or 9. Uh, according to all, uh, all that I show you after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. So that's what uh, Bezaliel is doing. All right, so that uh, brings us to chapter 38. And the altar, he made the altar of burnt offering of acacia wood. Five cubits was the length thereof, and five cubits the breadth thereof. It was four square, three cubits the height thereof. And he made the horns thereof on the four corners of it. The horns thereof were the same, and he overlaid it with brass. And you can go to Exodus 27, and you can see that the altar is fit in exactly the, the pattern that, that God gave. And he made all the vessels of the altar, the pots and the shovels and the basins and the flesh hooks, and the fire pans, all the vessels thereof, made he of brass. And he made for the altar a brazen grate of network, under the compass thereof, beneath it, uh, beneath unto the midst of it. And he cast four rings for the four ends of the grate of brass, to be places for the staves. And he made the staves of acacia wood, and overlaid them with brass. And he put the staves into the rings on the sides of the altar, to bear it withal. He made the altar hollow with a board. So again, there's the staves. This is how they were supposed to carry it. The whole altar and everything on it and everything that was associated with it was made according to the pattern. And he made the laver of brass and the foot of it uh, of brass at the looking glasses of the women assembling which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he made the court on the south side southward the hangings of the court were of fine twined linen, a hundred cubits. Their pillars were twenty and their brazen sockets twenty. The hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. And for the north side of the hangings were a hundred cubits. Their pillars were twenty, and their sockets of brass twenty, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver. And for the west side were hangings of fifty cubits, their pillars ten, and their sockets ten, and the hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver. Of course, the north and the south sides are, are longer. That's the long end of this courtyard area uh, in the tabernacle. And the, the back side, the west side, because it opened up to the east, the back side of it was a little bit shorter, so there's only ten instead of the twenty. And for the eastward side, 50 cubits. The hangings of the one side of the gate were 15 cubits. Their pillars three and their sockets three. Again, go back and look. It's exactly the way that, that God uh, said to have it built. And for the other side of the court gate, on this hand and on that hand, were hangings of 15 cubits. Their pillars three and their sockets three. All the hangings of the court round about were fine twined linen. And the sockets for the pillars were of brass. The hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver and the overlaying of their chapiters of silver, and all the pillars of the court were filleted with silver. And the hanging for the gate of the court was needlework of blue and purple and scarlet, and fine twine linen, and twenty cubits was the length and the height, and the breadth was five cubits, answerable to the hangings of the court. Basically the idea is that the, that means it was all united together into a single whole. And their pillars were four, and their sockets of brass four, their hooks of silver, and the overlaying of their chapiters and their fillets of silver. While this sounds familiar, it's because we've already read it. We've already read this in God giving these instructions to Moses. Now we're reading the detailed following of those commands to the last jot and tittle. And all the pins of the tabernacle and of the court round about were of brass. This is the sum of the tabernacle, even of the tabernacle of testimony or, or of covenant, as it was counted according to the commandment of Moses. For the service of the Levites by the hand of Ithamar, son to Aaron the priest. And Bezaliel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, the tribe of Judah, made all that, the, that Jehovah had commanded Moses. 
So he did everything that he was supposed to do. Didn't leave anything out, didn't add anything to it, did it according to as he was commanded, just like God said to do it. <clears throat> and with him was Aholiab, son of Asamach, of the tribe of Dan, an engraver and a cunning workman, and an embroiderer in blue and in purple and scarlet and fine linen. So, again, Bezaliel was the, 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 the big stuff, the architecture, the, the structure of the building, all of that, the, the metal work, the, the big heavy-duty stuff. And Aholiab was more of the fine craftsman. He was doing the, the engraving and the, the sewing and all of the, the very fine, precise needlework kind of stuff that needed to be done. Um, neither one is any more or less important than the other. They just did different things. Um, and uh, that was according to the skill that they had. So, um, <clears throat> all right, uh, verse 24, all the gold that was occupied for the work and all the work of the holy place, even the gold of the offering was 20 and nine talents, 730 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. Remember, the Israelites had brought more than enough, but what was used was exactly what had been commanded. And so when we, when we read this part here, we're seeing that what was commanded is exactly what was used and there isn't there isn't a farthing or a, a shekel or a denarius or any of tiny tiny little uh might difference in what they used and did compared to what god commanded them and that is very 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 important if we, if we understand the type any type uh, comparison Verse 25, And the silver of them that were numbered of the congregation was a hundred talents, and a thousand seven hundred and three score, and fifteen shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. A becca for every man, that is, half a shekel, just as commanded. After the shekel of the sanctuary, for every one that went to be numbered from twenty years old and upward, for six hundred thousand and three thousand and five hundred and fifty men. Six hundred, three thousand, five hundred and fifty men. That's the number of what we're, what we're dealing with here. This is not a large family anymore. This is a tribe. This is a huge wandering nation. I live in Clarksville, Tennessee. Clarksville does not have 600,000 people living in it. In fact, I don't even know what the population of Clarksville is, but I know it isn't that much. So population of Clarksville, Tennessee, and we can get to 2019. <laughs> 156,000. And of course we're growing, but you know, 156,000 is, is of course you can see here in Montgomery is the county we're in. Only 50,000 people live in outside of, of Clarksville. But 156,000 people compared to 600, uh, 603,000. That's huge, huge. And they've even lost some because of, of disobedience. And of the hundred talents of silver were cast the sockets of the sanctuary, the sockets of the veil, a hundred sockets of the hundred talents, a talent for a socket. And of the thousand seven hundred and seventy and five shekels he made hooks for the pillars and overlay their chapiters and filleted them. And the brass of the offering was seventy talents and two thousand and four hundred shekels. And therewith he made the sockets to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and the brazen altar and the brazen grate for it and all the vessels of the altar and the sockets of the court round about, and the sockets of the court gate, and all the pins of the tabernacle, and all the pins of the court round about. So there you have it. The building of the court of the tabernacle, the tabernacle itself, you have the uh, entire structure completely built according to the pattern that God gave Moses, down to the very last jot and tittle. The, for those of you who don't know what a jot is, if you look at an I, that little dot above the I, or a J, that little dot above the J, those are called iotas or, or jots. Um, and then the tittle is when you cross a T or you cross, uh, uh, like you put it in the A or some of the, the other letters where you have to go across like that, that's called a tittle. And so uh, down to the very last little bit. And that's why when we read in Matthew 5 that, that Jesus starts talking about the law, not one jot or tittle of the law will pass. That's how important and precise the commandments of God were for the Israelites. And so we're seeing here the exact carrying out of that. Of course, these people are scared uh, to an extent. They, they messed up 
they they made this golden calf and you know Moses came down the mountain and he he had those the the commandments of God and he broke them and was was angry and God was angry and then Moses is is frustrated and he tells him all right I'm gonna go see what God wants to do with you now and so when he goes back up for the next 40 days and 40 nights to to re-get all of those things on the stone tablets he comes back down and the people didn't make the same mistake twice they were ready to to jump on and do it and, and they they gave willingly they gave cheerfully they were like happy that god had given them another chance and so they they gave more than what was called for and then when they built the things that god commanded they followed his commands to the letter and we should do the same thing today I'm not saying that we should follow the old testament i'm not telling anybody to go out and build a tabernacle or an altar, or, or priestly vestments. I don't believe that anybody today is amenable to the Old Testament. We are amenable to the law of Christ, the New Testament. But when we follow that law, our responsibility is to follow as God has commanded us, without adding to or taking away. Look at the book of Revelation in, verse 20, in chapter 22, and <clears throat> verse uh, 18 and 19. Let's just pull that up real quick, just to give you a, a, a premise here under the, under the New Testament. That this is what we're supposed to do. Uh, For I testify unto every man that hears the words of this prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in the book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. That's the attitude that God had during the Old Testament. It is still the attitude that God has during the time of the New Testament. We don't get to add or take away. God can change the law. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 12 through 14, there was a need to change the law. Okay? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Because Jesus came out of Judah of which tribe Moses, there again, this law of specificity, when God specified that the, the, the priests under the law of Moses came from Levi and specifically were descendants of Aaron, Jesus could not be a priest. He could not be our high priest if the law of Moses was still in effect. The law of Moses is not still in effect. And everybody who's saying that we should still follow the law of Moses is saying that Jesus is not your high priest. Because if the law of Moses is still effective today, Jesus cannot be a priest. That's why there was a change in the law. And God can do that. God gave the law. He is the lawgiver and he can change the law. If God changes the law, that's great. We don't have the authority to change anything in the law that God has given us. The New Testament is what we are to follow. It's what we're amenable to. We follow it the way God has laid it out. And we don't, it, it is absolute arrogance for us to change that pattern, to think we know better than God, how we should organize the church, how we should be saved, how we should worship God. It's just arrogance is what it is. And so hopefully this has given us a better understanding of how important it is to follow that pattern. That's one of the great powerful things about Exodus. We've got two more chapters. I'm going to try to get both of them in tomorrow. Um, then uh, we'll be we'll be done with Exodus, and then uh, we'll, we might take a break for, for a day or two uh, before we get started into Leviticus. Leviticus is a rough one to get through. It's Leviticus is is Leviticus and Deuteronomy both. Uh, there's some history, there's some of that that story of what the people did in there, but a lot of it is just going through those laws that Moses brought down from the mountain and trying to understand what those laws are, what they mean, what, what they pointed to in the New Testament, especially, that's that's a big one, um, and trying to just, you know, why, why did God command them to do that? So, thank you for being here. Um, I uh, appreciate you uh, joining. If you got anything good out of this, please share um, so that others can participate. Love studying with you guys. Uh, as always, I get a lot out of this both prepping and then doing it again as a presentation. Some of that stuff you saw me doing um, was just me spur of the moment. I didn't, 
I didn't practice any of that. Looking up Uzzah, looking up the book of Hebrews, looking up the book of Revelation, those kinds of things. Those are just things that came to me during the study. I love doing this live where you can see my screen because you can see kind of my thought process, the logic that I follow to, uh, to kind of put the whole Bible together in perspective uh, for myself and hopefully for you all as well. So again, thank you for being here and uh, hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your first day of the week and hopefully we will see you tomorrow.